how do we get to where we are? Well, let's, this is the man here. This is the father of the Royal Canadian Armored Corps. His name was Frederick Frank Worthington, Major General at the time of his retirement, Fighting Frank. They played on the two FF, his initials, Frederick Frank. He was born, what I'm going to share with you, um, it's, it should be a movie. Like, you gotta, you gotta hear, like, when I share with you where this guy's been, what he's done, and uh, most of what I'm going to share with you was from different articles and stuff that were written, and they were co-authored by his son. So they're sharing everything. So he was born in 1889, Scotland. His family moved to California when he was, I don't know, seven or eight. Both his parents died when he was 11. So here he is in California, 11, he's alone. He was sent to live with his stepbrother, or sorry, his half-brother in Mexico. And he was, a in Mexico, he was a water boy in a Mexican mine at 11 years old. His brother was killed a year after he got there by the bandit Pancho Villa. <laughs> like, this is, it's hard to believe. So here he is, now he's got nobody. He ends up starting, how he got from being a water boy in a mine uh, to being, uh, having a career at sea. So he started it, he was a cabin boy in a number of cargo ships, that young. In 1907, so let me see now, he would be 11, he'd be 18. His military career started. He was a mercenary, a mercenary with the Nicaraguan, Nicaragua army against, when it was, it, it fought against San Salvador and Honduras. Well, they lost and he fled the country to avoid being captured. So then he ended up back in sea and he was sailing on cargo vessels. So loving the, I guess he loved the excitement of being a mercenary. In 1907, he was gun running at smuggling guns into Cuba. So he got captured and he was imprisoned in Cuba. So between 1908, there's a book that on Worthington, and I've not read it, so there's a lot of, I'm, and I don't have time to go into all the details, but he ended up getting out of prison. I don't know how long he served, whether it was a couple or several years, but he got out of prison. Again, he became a mercenary in 1913. He fought with Francisco Madero, who was the rebel against the Mexican government in well, the Mexican Civil War. 1913. Well, again, they lost. So he ended up back to sea. And he was sailing with cargo steamers. By this time, he wasn't just a cabin boy. He actually earned a board of trade papers as a second engineer. So that didn't last too long, though. In 1915, with the excitement of World War I starting up, he traveled to Montreal. The intent was he would go to Montreal and then go back to Scotland. He had this desire to join the Black Watch Regiment uh, of Scotland. Well, when he was in Montreal, he thought maybe he could join up there and he wouldn't have to pay for passage over, you know, over to England or sorry, to Scotland. But he ended up being recruited at a recruiting station in Montreal and he ended up, without realizing it, enlisting in the Canadian Black Watch. It was kind of funny. And this automatically made him a Canadian citizen. So this guy never set foot in Canada until 1915, when he was trying to get back to Scotland, where he was born. He was only, you know, again, he only lived in Scotland for six or seven years, but he was born there. So anyways... Uh, because of the experience he had as a mercenary, I guess in the quasi-military, he seemed to do rather well. And one thing led to another, and he ended up serving in the Canadian Machine Gun Corps. He put up number two, picture number two. So he was, when they first introduced the Canada War uh, Museum, 
has one of these. It's uh, it's pretty cool. It's the only one, isn't it, in Canada? That we know of, yes, correct. That we know of. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, and he was ordered, sorry, sorry, he was awarded the military medal for actions around Vimy Ridge. And he made a statement to his son, and um, his son quoted, he said he didn't really feel Canadian until Vimy Ridge. Now, remember, you know, he just became Canadian in 1950 when he joined the Canadian Black Watch. Now, it's not, I think a lot of people didn't feel Canadian over there until Vimy Ridge, because this is where they brought all of the Canadian battalions together and fought under Canadian command. And they actually did what the French and the British didn't succeed in doing. That was taking Vimy Ridge. So it's, it's kind of cool. So that was his involvement there. After World War II, he was a proponent of adopting armored vehicles. That was his first taste of it. And he stayed in, in the unit. In 1930, it's quite a jump up. Um, now he's a captain. He actually took an eight month course on armor in 1930. Um, let's show the next one, number five. Oops, there he is there. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Um, oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I put things out of, out of sync here. Do we have number, go to number five. I forgot to mention to you. There it is. We used, we had 12 of these. This is the predecessor to the Bren gun carrier. And it was a, a 12, uh, we had 12 Carden Lloyd machine gun carriers is what they were called. You see they have a Vickers on the front. It looks like a Vickers. Um, and they were very small. They were hard to drive and they were very fragile. Um, but that's all we had. That was the six month course in 1930 in Canada. Um, by 1936, he's now a major and he became an instructor at the Royal Tank School, Bovington. Worthington, Worthy, Fighting Frank, was an instructor in Bovington. Now, how cool is that? 1936. By 1938, he returned to Borden as, now he's a colonel, returned to Borden as the commandant of the Canadian Armored Fighting School. There he is there. That's him standing, I think, in the middle at the back. Trying to read left to right front. That's him there, is it? That's like uh, actually, no, no. That's him in the front, kneeling. Mm -hmm. Not him, below. That's him there. Because it says the front, the front of the, yeah, that's him. That's worthy to, right there in the middle. Anyways, that's a very early picture. <clears throat> and uh, so he became the commandant of the Canadian Armored Fighting School. Now, this is, this is very interesting because in 1938, we didn't have any tanks. We had nothing. We had those old carriers that were there. So he looked to the U.S. This is a really cool story. He ended up getting 265 Renault tanks, 1917 tanks. They were built. That's them there. They were built in the U.S., but they're Renault design. And... General George Patton was involved. And just like the Lend-Lease situation, which wasn't really into play yet, they could not sell to a foreign country. Canada was foreign, obviously. But what they could do is, George Patton arranged to have the 265 Renault tanks scrapped and sold as scrap value and sent to a foundry to be cut up and melted. Now listen to this. They were shipped to the Camp Borden foundry. <laughs> Attention, Mr. F. F. Worthington. <laughs> How cool is that? This guy, he, he was very direct. He had very innovative ways of getting things done. So they shipped these all up. 
not to the foundry. They shipped them to the Canadian Armed Forces. They shipped them to, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Worthington, who took them in, and that's what we had. Now, <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny, but these are very old tanks, very slow. I mean, you could you imagine you could talk through an exercise quicker than these things could walk through them. Very interesting. Okay, so 1938, we got something a little more modern. We got two Vickers light tanks. Could you show number four, please? That's the Vickers tank there. Um, we got uh, two of them in 1938. And then in 1939, we got 10 more of them. Is this number six? Yeah, that's the, that's the Vickers right there. All right, that's number six. Good, thanks. So no tanks. He bought them. So in early 1940, having gone to all this, NDHQ, they ordered the tank school closed in early 40. It was ordered to shut down. And then something changed the mindset. Hitler, Rommel, the, the massive sweep. And you got to remember, there was the phony war that went on 39, 40. So in 40, when the Germans actually invaded France, Belgium, they showed what armor could do. So in all the wisdoms, now the Canadian and the HQ decided, oh, you know what? We're a little hasty. We're going to reopen that school. So they reopened it. And that's it. They reversed their decision based on that. So in 1942, because the school now was developing and growing, the Meaford range was open because they didn't have adequate ranges in, uh, uh, in Borden. And I think uh, you're aware of that. There's a lot of uh, small arms ranges in Borden and uh, the big stuff's in Meaford. And I know a lot of us that uh, were with the Antars, uh, we've, we've done time on the ranges in both Borden and Meaver uh, for different things. So let's go back to the first picture again. Picture one, let's put Worthy up. From 1940 to 1942, Worthy's now a Brigadier General. He was posted to England to command the 1st Army Tank Brigade. So there was a bit of a problem. In August of 42, there was a bit of a, a shuffle. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, it wasn't. It was in 40, 42. Sorry, early 44. Worthy, basically, he had to relinquish his command of the 4th Armored Division. Officially, they said he was due to poor, poor health. But in fact, it was an internal political kind of struggle. Um, in the changing of the Canadian Army commanders, Worthy supported Lieutenant Colonel Andrew McNaughton, uh, but he didn't get it. And I guess he was pretty vocal about it. Instead, uh, Lieutenant General Guy Simmons, uh, he's the one that got the command and Worthy was not, uh, uh, he was in good standing with him. So he was simply edged out in favor of other people. Uh, later, uh, Simmons uh, acknowledged to, to Worthy that was one of the biggest mistakes in his life was not to have him uh, commanding uh, that brigade going through uh, Europe after D-Day. But that's the way it was. He, the re biggest regret Worthy ever had himself was that he did not have the ability to command a division in the war. So he returned to, to Camp Bovington Camp Bobbington, I'm sorry, Camp Borden in April 44. And he found out that things were running amok. There was a lot of black market stuff going on in Borden. There was a lot of uh, stuff, truckloads coming in at night to take army stuff and it was going out. There was several major official roads into Borden and there was a number of back roads into Borden. He basically went a little ballistic on this. He set up provost at every stop. People were checked. All vehicles going in were checked. All vehicles coming out were checked. We were on a war 
wartime footing anyways, but he did this. But here's one of the most amazing things that he did. Some of the back roads, he mined them. He put mines in the back roads. So if you tried to come in them, which were unofficial, you, you blow up. And he was smart because when you have a landmine, you could have the landmine where you run over, but you could also have a trigger. He would separate the mine from the trigger. So when a, a truck went over the trigger, it wouldn't set off the mine right underneath it. The mine would be 50 feet away and it would go off. So people didn't know that, but this is what he did. So vehicles are going in, trying to steal government goods, taxpayer funded military supplies. I don't know, just food, clothing, who knows? Could have been ammunition, guns, but there was quite a black market. He clamped down on it. Um, I thought that was one of the most gutsy thing I've ever heard anyone do. You know, the word went out that this guy, this new commandant of Camp Borden, mined the roads. And he had trenches dug on each side of the road so no one could drive around on the main entrances coming in. So this guy, he was pretty direct. Um, so... In 1948, his career ended. In 1449, he was given the title. He was named the Colonel Commander of the Royal Canadian Armored School at Borden. He held that position until his death. Um, in 1952, Worthington himself established the Worthington Trophy uh, after the candidates filled out uh, they, they had two year course they graduated and the highest level uh, of marks and leadership Worthy gave his own sword to serve as the trophy but that evolved in 1962 they established the Worthington uh, Military Museum they established the trophy let's go to number seven Sorry, um, I meant 11. Okay. This, the Worthington Trophy. I don't know if any of you guys know these guys. I don't recognize them. But this is when the Antars won the Worthington Trophy. Um, based at the Oshawa Armories, was honored for ranking the highest among Canada's 18 reserve units. And uh, it's a chrome-plated model, mock-up of a centurion. Very cool. Again, I don't recognize any of those three individuals there. So I don't know what timeline that is actually either. Maybe some of you guys can help us out there. But um, So they established a museum. Now let's go back to seven. There we go. Worthington Park. When you drive on to uh, Camp Borden and you pass this Worthington Park, you notice there's the, uh, the big commemorative to him, again, being the father of the Royal Canadian Armored Corps. And uh, it was quite, a, quite an active thing. He, um, the park, we're going to see pictures of the park here in a moment, but I can remember at 16 years old, uh, I was on a, a course in Borden and uh, on one of the evenings off time, I walked over and I s jumped up uh, up on the Panther. That Panther is now in the Canada War Museum and I may have shared this with you guys before, but it was, I just sat up there. I'm on a German Panther. I just couldn't believe it. My grandfather, as you all know, was in the Canadian or was in the Ontario Regiment he never went overseas. He was part of the, the home group there. And uh, whenever I was sick, uh, he died when I was 15. But whenever I was a kid and he was sick, he always bought me a model tank. And he bought me a, a Sherman. He bought me a T-34. And he bought me a Panther. And I always loved the design of the Panther. So here I am, you know, uh, a year 
or two after his death and I'm sitting on this panther just reminiscing about this thing in the history and how much I had read about it and everything. So anyways, that was pretty cool. Just a, a walk down memory lane there. Okay, um, let's go to the next picture. There's a few we can go through here. That kind of looks like him in a little different kind of way, but that's quite a memorial. That's bigger than life, really broad shouldered. Gentlemen, let's move on to the next pick. When he died, and he died in, when was it? 18, uh, 1960, geez, I don't have it in front of me. When he died and he had an official funeral um, in Ottawa, they flew his body by RCAF Caribou uh, because, oh, sorry, he died in 67, December 8th, 1967. And his request was that he be buried in Worthington Park. And they honored that. And uh, so it almost guarantees there will always be a Worthington Park. I mean, they've got the father of Canadian armor buried at the park. I think that's, uh, that's very cool. He wanted to be there, and that's, that's where he is. Next picture. Now, shortly after, I guess it was in 1973, they established the Baseboard Museum. Uh, and there is Worthy's outfit. That's, that's his kit. Not that dissimilar to how we have it on display, uh, Colonel Sam, um, in our museum. And we have a lot of uh, other um, artifacts from uh, um, Colonel or Major General Hall. Um, but anyways, that's just cool. And that's a museum that we uh, uh, are, just before the pandemic, we had uh, reached an accord and we were walking down a very collaborative path, I thought. We had, we had opened the door and we hope to, uh, you know, uh, nurture that uh, relationship that we had established after all this crazy, crazy, crazy times. So anyways, coming back to... Uh, the first picture, or the last picture. That man, fighting Frank. Think about it. Born in Scotland. Moved as a young kid to California. Both his parents killed. Going to Mexico, being a water boy in a Mexican mine. His half-brother, the only living sibling uh, or relative left it, that we're aware of, uh, he's killed by a famous Mexican bandit, Pancho Villa. This guy then goes as a, water, a cabin boy on a steamship. Then he ends up being a mercenary in Nicaragua fighting against two countries, El Salvador and Honduras. And then after that, he ends up smuggling guns into Cuba. This is this, he lacked, did not lack for excitement in this man's life. Does some prison time. What's he do when he gets out? Does he turn into a farmer? No, he's a mercenary for the rebels in Mexico. And that didn't, that didn't go too well. And then it was shortly after that that he ended up coming up to Montreal. Why? To get back in the fight, to get back in a fight. This man, he was very direct. He spoke his mind. His son's name is Peter Worthington. You might wonder, does that name ring a bell to some of you? Well, I don't know where he is now, to be honest, but he was the editor-in-chief. He always had the editorial in the Toronto Sun. Everyone working in General Motors had a Toronto Sun. And uh, when you got past page three, you always looked at the editorial. And uh, it was Peter Worthington, his son, known to be very outspoken, known to be very direct, and known to upset a lot of people. He was his father's son. Anyway, that basically concludes uh, a little bit of an overview on a very exciting man, a very noteworthy man. And just like when I did the uh, Radley Walters, um, I learned so much about General Worthington, just looking in and doing some basic research and sharing this stuff with you. So uh, it's a, extremely rewarding for me to do that because I, I learned so much. And again, 
another man we must uh, do a tribute to, uh, undoubtedly in our museum, the father of Canadian armor. We are the epitome of Canadian armor. I have a, a colleague here from the Royal Canadian Armored Corps Association, Michael Borey. Michael, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, you said you had a comment. I, for sins in my past life, I, I now teach Canada's military history at the Royal Military College. And I served uh, for several thousand years in the Army. And uh, if, if I may, and I'm not trying to, uh, to, uh, to stir up membership in the Royal Canadian Armoured Corps Association, but there is a reason why from the beginning of armor in the Canadian Army uh, that um, General Worthington plays such an important part. He is in fact a godfather. Uh, he's one of many godfathers, if I may, amongst them is General E.L.M. Burns, who does a lot of the organization to get tank regiments going in our army. Yeah. Uh, and there are other, other senior officers who help, who help Worthington with this. But Worthington himself insisted from the very beginning, and it's clear on the documentation, uh, that he, he felt that it was, an enormous, it was enormously important to keep the, armored, the Royal Canadian Armored Corps Association together, together uh, as a source of, cohe of cohesion and, uh, and of a way of, su of surviving, if you will, the, the inevitable wars of bureaucracy within the Canadian forces. He was also, uh, even, well, until his death in 1967, and I was on his last parade, and that's quite an honour for me, but even up to that time, he kept a very, a very close eye on exactly what kinds of equipment were being purchased. Uh, the kind of uh, cohesion that caused we carried on after his death and was very much a part of the Royal Canadian Armored Corps Association's bureaucratic battle to keep the tank. So from Worthington through the association and through your excellent museum, especially in its latest uh, interpretation, it's all a part of the cohesion. Now, so what? So what? Um, we, we operate in an infantry army. We have to seize that. And we're always in the backseat, bureaucratically, um, for strange reasons, for reasons that, that a PhD in sociology might explore. The, the notion of tank is seen, is, it causes allergic reactions amongst the hierarchy in the army. And uh, that's still there. And there's still uh, quite a resistance overcome during Afghanistan, but still quite a resistance to purchasing tanks in our little army. And that's why your museum is so important uh, to keep that notion of tanks and its requirement and its necessity and its central place in, in, in the new warfare in everyone's minds. So if I may say that uh, above and beyond merely opening up tanks to the public, You've done a tremendous job and you continue to do a tremendous job in, um, in keeping that armor spirit going. And uh, I'm glad that, if I may, I'm glad that uh, there, there's an association between the association and your excellent museum. If I can just end with a couple of comments on Worthington. Um, in the Black Watch, and that's where I started my career, uh, my time in the army. Uh, in the Black Watch, he was known as a determined, fierce fighter. He was a sergeant, section, uh, sorry, platoon sergeant, and he won the MM. And, and he was seen to be a, a, a quite a, a uh, the word mercenary is being used. He was seen to be quite a pro, quite a determined soldier. And it's um, it's not surprising that later on he goes on to be, in fact, the the vanguard point of our acquisition of tanks later on. Um, we narrowly missed, unfortunately for some, we narrowly missed in the going to war in 19, or continuing the war in 1919 and 1920, which would have seen all Canadian tank units coming online. The equipment was being produced, the soldiers were being trained in Montreal, and uh, the war ended in, of course, in November 1918. But nonetheless, Worthy, Worthington uh, took that, even as a Patricia officer took that, that beginning, if you will, of, of the spirit of armor and propelled it into the Second World War and beyond. And we're very lucky to have had him because uh, lesser personalities might not have produced as much. And thank you very much for letting me in this meeting. And uh, um, that's all I have. Oh, thank you very much for contributing. Uh, you, your, your words were very welcome and very interesting. 